Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Today is um, Sabbath, May 30th, 2020. And um, we've been looking at the we've been looking at the uh, the sanctuary message, and in this series we've looked at the altar of sacrifice, the bronze laver, which uh, characterize the which characterize the the outer court of the sanctuary and um, and today we're going to look at the table for showbread and so the table for showbread is the next item now it later on uh, we'll see why I, I, I start with the table for showbread but the as we as we look at the the um, as we look at the uh, the the sanctuary right here and we can see on the bottom we can see the altar of offering or the altar of sacrifice and the bronze liver then since we looked at that part the bronze liver last week then right now we are officially all, um, done with the courtyard or the outer court and now we have moved to the holy place of the sanctuary and in that part or that compartment there are three items or three furniture we have the table for showbread we have the golden candlesticks and the altar of incense now let me actually say something to make it very clear in the courtyard or the out of the outer court everything was um, overlaid with bronze it was made with wood but overlaid with bronze and when you enter the first compartment and when you go beyond the first floor which is the second compartment everything in there is overlaid with gold and so as of now everything we're going to talk about is golden so you have the golden table, you have the golden uh, table for showbread, the golden candlesticks, the golden the golden altar of incense, and the golden ark of the covenant. Everything is gold. And so now that we've gone through the courtyard, and we're gonna enter into the holy place. And in the holy place, um, any of these three, the on the first part, the first compartment, any of the of these three the showbread, the candlesticks, or the incense can be um, used primarily. But usually we realize that they all work together, but um, in the in the message of the sanctuary, they have each its own place. And the Ark of the Art of Incense is closer to the to the second veil than the candlesticks and the uh, and the showbread. And so today we're gonna look at the table for showbread and we're gonna see what it actually means the table for showbread what is the table for showbread actually about so the question is why the name table for showbread well of course it's a table and so that's probably um, already jumped out of you it's a table and um, in Exodus chapter 25 verse 23 and actually in, the, in chapter 25 verse 8 that's what God said to Moses, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And so that then God started to give him the the attribute of the sanctuary. And in verse 23, it talks about the table for showbread. And it says, You shall also make a table of Akasha weed, Akasha wood. Two cubits shall be its length, a cubit its width and a cubit and a half its height and just so you know that's the same um, size of the altar of, of the Ark of the Covenant um, and you shall overlay it with pure gold and make a molding of gold all around and you shall set the showbread on the table before me always and so the table for showbread it has its name because you have, you have to build a table and you put bread on it and the term showbread is not to make to show off in a sense it's a way of saying 
And this bread has to be in my presence all day throughout your entire generation. And so that's where the term Shobet comes from. Now, I'm not, I, I didn't want to go to the, to the Greek or Hebrew term of it because it's not um, necessary for this. Because this one right here is, uh, this is just the basic of the, of the sensory message. So we're not going to go deep into uh, what it means for everything. Unless it's necessary. Now, what are the components of the table? And so if it's a table, it has components. Well, the table, one, it has, it was made with acacia wood overlaid with gold. We saw that. It was two cubits long, two, one cubit wide, and one and a half cubits high, height. Um, and let me, for some reason, I guess I didn't do that one right, right here. Two cubits long. One cubit wide. And so, uh, I just wanted to correct that part quickly. And so, um, um, so that's, that's the, um, that's the, 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 one of the things. And then, of course, it's gold molding crown all around of it. So we put gold over the whole table. And um, the molding was the width of the hand, meaning the molding meaning like for the, for the, it was supposed to be the hand so you can use it and to put the bread and secure the bread. So that's why it was supposed to be uh, in the size of the hand. And then we also have the vessels. So the table contains the vessels. There were four vessels of pure gold on the table with the bread. So the vessels were there as well for the bread, the dishes, bread plates, and we had uh, uh, pans or spoons for the frankincense to sprinkle the frankincense on the bread. Uh, I guess type of uh, oil, pitchers for liquid offerings, and the bowls for vessels containing the frankincense. And so. These are the the components of the table for Shabbat. Now, um, how many loaves did the table contain? If you're going to put bread on the table, there has to be a number of bread you're going to put. And in Leviticus 24, verse number 5, verse number 6, we do find the table, the bread of the tabernacle. And verse number 5, it says, And you shall take fine flour and bake 12 cakes with it. So, how many breads, how many loaves of bread? Twelve. Two tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake. And that's the measure to put in each cake. You shall set them in two rows, six in a row, on the pure gold, on the pure gold table before the Lord. And so there was supposed to be six on one side and six on the other side to make it twelve. That means we have two rows of six. And, um, that's a, I don't know if number six is a significant number in the Bible, but we know that number two is a, is a good one because we have two testimonies or two testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so that, that actually is part of the, that actually is part of the reason why, possibly. But number 12 has a, is significant in the Bible. Uh, and I'll tell you that later on. Now let's look at the showbread. Well, the purpose of the table was to show the bread, of course, which were 12 small flat rounded loaves that were laid out in an orderly fashion so as to be displayed. And so it was supposed to be displayed um, and before God, not for fashion show, but God had his purpose of putting it that way. And so the fine flour, well, the fine flour is basically taken from the earth, meaning as natural as it could be, not processed to refinement. And just so you guys know, I don't know if you guys do do this kind of thing, but um, 
people that people like to eat white bread and they assume that when you eat white bread is the best bread actually white bread is the worst bread because all the minerals all the protein all the calcium all the um all the good things that come in the wheat is refined and they take it all out and you get that, uh, that white stuff that's left which is in a sense i call it trash because white bread is not good for you it, it doesn't give you any nourishment at all it's all um it's basically anything white except for rice anything white that is processed sugar white sugar same thing um because when you look at sugar cane if you if you if you take sugar cane even though it looks white if you boil sugar cane it's gonna become about it's gonna become reddish so and when you refine it then it becomes white and so white sugar as well is not a good thing for you to consume white bread is not a good thing for you um ri white rice is actually natural there is different types of rice there's white rice there's brown rice there's yellow rice each of them come uh, in natural form it's not processed that makes it white rice it just comes out white when you take it from the grain because when i grew up my dad was an agriculture engineer and we used to bring in like some bags of rice with the with the peel on it and so we have to peel it off and once we take the the skin off it comes out white and so it's not that we processed it it just comes out that color so that's a different story between rice and some of the things that you guys eat so um big big means agony and suffering meaning as the flour goes through the heat of the fire to be baked we need to go through the fiery trials to be molded and what that means is um you know if you if you have a shirt right you have a shirt on you and you want to make it uh, as neat as possible uh, when you iron it it has to be hot if it's cold iron it's not gonna take out the wrinkles right the wrinkles from the shirt and so uh, heat will refine uh, the shirt to make to get the wrinkles to get the wrinkles out and so the same for us since God has to 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 refine us and mold us we have to go through that um, fiery trials which will refine ourselves becoming like gold and so that's the purpose of um, fire in our lives and so for the big for, for the bread to be big it has to go through fire it has to go to that refinement to make it become perfect and good because nobody would like to eat cold flour more likely for somebody would eat hot flour because it would taste better and so that's the idea of baked flour now um last thing not last thing unleavened bread unleavened not artificial unleavened why because leaven uh, and actually i put it right here it means that there will be no the meaning that there will not be corrupt things in our lives jesus said to beware of the leavened bread of the pharisees which is a symbol of corruption and deception mixed with truth and we, we can actually understand because when you when you eat leavened bread uh, because of the yeast in it it makes it bigger and you think you're eating a lot bread, a lot of bread but actually you're not because the the, the yeast makes it um thicker not because it has more substance in it but it makes it put more i guess you could say air into it makes it look bigger when that's really you can just flatten it out and then it's very thin so that's the thing about unleavened bread and so when you eat unleavened bread it's actually compact and it's um and you know that you're eating something because when you take a bite then you can you can you can see that it is heavy in your mouth instead of something big and then it can just be swallowed in maybe 10 seconds so the the unleavened bread the leaven the leavened bread of the pharisees is it it, it 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 gives you the impression that it has a lot of substance but in the end it's empty 
And so that's why Jesus said to beware of the leaven, bread of the Pharisees. Now, uh, this is for the show bread. Let's move on. Well, when was the bread provided? Um, well, in the book of Leviticus chapter 24, verse 8 and verse 9, he says that every Sabbath, he, the high priest, shall set it the bread in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant, and it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in the holy place, in the holy place, for it is most holy to him, from the offerings of the Lord made by fire by perpetual perpetual statute. And I didn't put that on the I didn't put it on the PowerPoint. But if you remember when David and his uh, and some of the soldiers came from the battle and they were hungry and they came to the prophet, I forgot which one it was actually. I forgot it was no, not the prophet, the priest. And um, he asked the priest, "Do you have any bread to eat?" And the priest said, "Well, I don't have any common bread, but I have holy bread that was just made for the Sabbath." And he said, can I have some of that? He said, well, in a sense, you can't. But because he was hungry, and the priest asked him, have you been close to any woman? Meaning, have you been in a in a relation, in an intimate time with a woman? And they said, no. And then they took the bread and ate because they were hungry. And I think it's in the book of First Samuel. Uh, I totally forgot it, to put that part in. But if you go to that part, and you can Google it, you're going to find it, where, Mo, where David was hungry and ate all that bread that was not supposed to be to be eaten by him, but only the high priest could eat the bread and the priest. And so, uh, on Sabbath, they had to put new bread on the Sabbath. They had to put new bread because the Sabbath was a, a, a special day, which is a, basically a feast day. Sabbath is a feast day. Uh, that's why we don't fast on Sabbath unless you have taken an oath to God say okay Lord I want to do 10 day 10 day challenge fasting that's a different story but on Sabbath we don't fast because it's a feast day to the Lord and so the bread was to be baked for the Sabbath freshly for the Sabbath and then it could be used throughout the week and other things like that now um, so the, the showbread uh, every seventh day or Sabbath, fresh hot loaves were provided by Aaron, by Aaron, uh, the pre by Aaron. So every seventh day, every Sabbath, fresh hot loaves were provided by Aaron. The priests were entitled to eat the old loaves while standing in the holy place. So the old loaves that were there during the week, either they were made on one day of the week or maybe every single day, they were to eat that bread while the new bread, the hot one, was provided for the Sabbath. The frequent sense that was removed each week was, in, was a special oblation or offering to God. And so with frequent is oil. Um, and of course we need the oil, God's oil, which is the Holy Spirit in our lives uh, and so 12 loaves was the same material size and weight no partiality everything had to be the same thing it, it doesn't have to, it, you can't make one loaf uh, bigger and the other one a bit smaller or one loaf thicker and the other one a bit um, uh, less thick in a sense so you have to do the same size. And so according to Leviticus 22, if a priest was unclean, he could not eat of the showbread. No layman or daughter married to a layman or a hired servant could eat of the showbread. But a purchased slave or those born in his house could. And so the, the priest couldn't, if he, if he was unclean, he couldn't. The layman couldn't, but a slave, which is purchased, or could actually eat of that bread. 
I'm not sure exactly why I would have to go back and restudy and find out why that's the case, but we'll see later on. And and so of course there are some traditions in it. So in according to tradition, eight priests held hands as they chanted the bread and passed it to fellowship. Now we don't know if that is really correct biblically, but that could be added by people since of course they've been since the the law was totally changed by the Pharisees, making in the law a burden instead of a uh, a blessing. And so that could be part of the tradition too. Um, they were to be holy because of the bread. That's another thing. So, as well, we know that the the table for showbread is everything about the sanctuary is related to Jesus Christ, and so we shouldn't be surprised if the table for showbread is a type of Christ. And here he says that. The table of showbread was referred to as the table of the presence. And the reason it's called the table of the presence, remember, remember we looked at right here in the book of, no, in the, in Leviticus 24, um, it says in verse number 6, You shall set them in two rows, six in a row, on the pure gold table before the Lord. And so, this is why this is why it's called the table of the presence because it was supposed to be perpetually in the presence of God. And if you think about it, Jesus' name is also called the angel of his presence. And so and that's part of the that's actually part of the identity of Jesus Christ too. And so that's that's another thing. Um God's light forever shines on his people. The twelve the twelve big cakes of bread spoke of God's people who were one with him as the priest joined for the fellowship of eating the bread and becoming one. Jesus referred to himself as the bread of life and said if we eat if we eat this bread we will live forever. The very nature of bread is to provide physical sustenance and as you eat the bread and digest it it becomes part of you the very nature of the word of god is to provide spiritual sustenance and as it is received it becomes part of our very nature and that's why people will live off the bread of god or the word of god they act differently they talk differently they walk differently they dress differently everything that the world does they do it the opposite of it because they want they want to follow God than the world, and so whenever you see somebody who is who profess to be a Bible believing Christian, who profess to study God's word, and you and you, and you don't see the action lining up, then that person is lying because if they eat that bread, which is the word of God, it will become part of them and they will start doing things just as God says to do. And so, just as the table also speaks of fellowship when in communion, so the table of showbread points to Jesus who has made a covenant built on the better promises and provided a blood covenant meal for us to partake that we might all be one in the spirit. And what is that blood covenant meal? It's the last supper. If you think about it, in the book of Matthew chapter 24, no, not 24, 25 and 26, in, uh, and in Luke chapter 22, in chapter 23, we find uh, um, John chapter 13, also, we find Jesus instituting the Last Supper, the bread and the wine. Or you call it the fruit of the vine. So the bread and fruit of the vine meaning his body and his blood. And once we partake of his body and his blood, we become one with him in nature. And so we, and by doing this, we are to live up to that standard and leave the worldly things behind. And so that's the purpose of the table of showbread is to show us that we need to live of, of the word of God. 
and the development actually is in a sense the word of God. And um, let's show that in John chapter 6 verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And verse 51 to verse 58, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And if the bread that I and the bread that I and the bread that I shall give is my flesh. And so remember again, in the Lord's Supper, Jesus said to the disciples, Here is my body, which is broken for you. Take this and eat uh, in, memory, in, in remembrance of me. And it's not literally God, um, Jesus' body, but in the sense it's, um, it's uh, uh, a symbolic or symbolic um, gesture of eating the bread of God or, or eating the word of God. And of course, when we talk about eating the word of God, we don't go, we don't go and take the Bible and stop and start ripping off pages and eat it. But it means to study it and to it means to study it so we are acquainted and familiar with what God wants to, us to do. So, and the bread that I shall and the bread and the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarrelled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Most assuredly I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Why? Because, and according to Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Uh, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has his own life, and I will raise him up at the last days, at the, at the last day. For my flesh is full indeed, and my blood is drank indeed. Uh, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread of which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead, he who eats this bread will live forever. And so here Jesus is um, here Jesus is comparing here Jesus is comparing uh, the the eating of manna the eating of manna with the with the bread of life. And so the the purpose is is that um, we understand that manna was temporary and so but God and Jesus' body or yeah Jesus' body or flesh is eternal. So but of course um, we have to come to the the present applications of what is going on because according to the century message we know that uh, Satan always tries to counterfeit everything that God does and, and um, I'm going to bring out something and the reason I'm, I'm bringing it up is for us to know and not that I actually uh, and don't, don't think that I actually hate people no, I don't, thank God but I do hate when for what people do sometimes and one of the things that I don't like is that they take God's word and twist it and it, or even totally um, lie about it. And so let me show you what I'm talking about. Um, this is this is here Pope Francis back in 20, 2016 in a message that he gave. And if you know your Bible, um, I want you to realize this one because this is an interesting thing that happened. Um, he was talking about the the three the loud cry. Or the three voices. Okay. And so he said that the first voice spoke was the cry, referring to the cry that is the loud, loud voice of the angel, as we read 
in the passage taken from the book of Revelation chapter 18, verse 1 to verse 2, and chapter 21, 23, uh, from chapter 18, 1 and 2, 21, 23, and chapter 19, 1 and 3, and chapter 9, and verse 9, proposed for the first reading. He said that the angel cried with a loud voice, Babylon has fallen. Now, I'm going to take my Bible here, and I'm going to read what what actually the Bible says. And this is the dangerous thing that I, I, I would like, I, I, I'm trying to warn people. You can't just take um, somebody's words just because they supposedly have some uh, hierarchy in the church and, and, and think that because this is something, it is true. Because they also are sinners just like you and they can lie. Let's see, chapter 18, Revelation chapter 18. The book of chapter 18 of, of Revelation, verse number 1 and verse number 2. He says, And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and great, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the kid of every unclean and hateful bird. And here he says, the angel said, Babylon has fallen. And I'm probably sure many people that were listening to him would not even think about, let me go back to the Bible and read for myself. No, what they do is to just accept whatever he said because they think he would never lie to them. And he is lying to them. Bible says Babylon is fallen, and says Babylon has fallen. Well, let's see, verse number twenty-one uh, and verse number twenty-three. Oh, it's actually not even that part. Doesn't even talk about um, Babylon falling anymore. It's just the first part that talks about Babylon, the the the, the fallen state. Of Babylon, and so, and so, um, the Bible clearly says that Babylon is fallen, not has fallen. Meaning, the complete fall, the complete fall of Babylon, is not yet achieved, and that will happen when the the fall of Babylon will happen. When the mark of the beast is enforced. If you know what the mark of the beast is, it is not a chip, it's not a, it's not a it's not a, a code, it's not a six six six, it's not the Pope either or the Pope or the papacy either. The mark of the beast is basically a law that will force people to worship on a certain day that is opposed to God's day, mainly Sunday worship. Yes, Sun, when Sunday becomes the uh, the day of worship by law, f enforced by legislative powers of the nations, that will be the mark of the beast. Because God's true day is the seventh day Sabbath, as we saw earlier in the in the power in the in the PowerPoint, every Sabbath that the the, the showbread was to be baked and put. On the table, and so here he's totally lying about it because Bible is clear about Babylon is fallen, not has. So, and the prophets claim that corruption grew within the hearts of the people who took it to all of us, they brought it to all of us on the path of corruption. Corruption is the way of living blasphemy. The prophets claim corruption is a form of blasphemy. The language of this Babylon, of this worldliness, blasphemy, there is no God. However, there is the God of money, the God of well being, and the God of exp there is the God of money, of well being, and, of, and the God of exploitation. And this is just his words, but if you know your Bible and you know your history, you can know who actually Babylon is, which is papacy. And he is at the head of the papacy. So he is also part of it. But I hope that one day he turns his life around and gives it to Christ. 
and truly seeks to follow Christ and truly seeks to follow his commandments and live according to <clears throat> and live according to God's principles. Now and this is actually something interesting enough for me to bring it up. Um, there is a quote from the book Great Controversy in um, paragraph 60 page 60 paragraph 1 and paragraph 2 that says popery had become the world this part kings and emperors bowed to the decrees of the Roman pontiff the destinies of men both for time and for eternity seemed under his control for hundreds of years the doctrines of Rome had been ex extensively and implicitly received its rites re reverently performed, its festivals generally observed. Its clergy were honored and literal and liberally sustained. Never since has the Roman Church attained to greater dignity, magnificence, or power. And even today, even today, if the Pope says something, everyone bows down. But except those that are following God, they will not bow down. Why? Because when you study the Bible, you know what God says and what the Pope says, or not just the Pope, but all of its allies, you will be, if you want to follow God truly, you're also going to be, you're not going to be bowing down to whatever the Pope says. And here again, that was way back in the Dark Ages era, where people would just fall down and worship. And you would think, even though so much light has been shown, people would, would then turn and follow God. No, people still listen to whatever the Pope says. And then if he says um, no, then you don't do it. If he says yes, then you do it, which is a form of worship, which only God should have. And But the, the very next part, um, sentence is, interestingly, the noon, but the noon of the papacy was the midnight of the world. And if you didn't know what I'm talking about right now, look at friends. Look at friends. Look at what happened to friends. You see, the moment the moment you you follow the papacy's, um, uh, I would say, dogmas or doctrines, you will get into chaos. The Pope said what? Um, to combat climate change, supposedly climate change, um, we have to um, raise the, the, the tax on the gas prices to get people to to get people to, to use less gas um, so they don't have to uh, drive that many times because that will um, affect the climate. And then what did France do? France passed the law. They raised the tax on the gas, and what happened? Riot, bloodshed, and so it, it, it looks as though friends never learned her lesson that when you follow the papacy, you're gonna fall into ruin. But for those of you that are listening, I hope you take this warning: if you follow the papacy, you will fall into ruin. And so, just so you know, not my words, you're gonna see for yourself. Now, um, as we talked about the the, the Pope um, totally lying about what the Bible says, we also find in some we also find that some versions of the Bible do the same thing. They would take something from the Bible and twist it. And this is God's word. This is bread. Remember, Jesus said to the disciples, "Beware of the." Leaven bread of the Pharisees. Well, we have to remember that the we have to remember that the leavened bread of the Pharisees can also be applied to today, because many of the Bibles being you being um, given out now have have misconstrued what God said, and they have taken God's character or God's name, or attribute, 
and they have given it to Satan. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, let me show you what I'm talking about. Here, we're going to look at, we're going to compare some, some version of the Bible. We're going to look at, uh, let me put down right here. We're going to look at the contemporary English version. Okay. We're going to look at two verses. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12 and Revelation chapter 22 verse 16. In Isaiah chapter 2 verse, chapter 14 verse 12 it says, You, the bright morning star, have fallen from the sky. You who brought down other nations, now you are brought down. Now if you know your Bible, if you know what chapter 14 of Isaiah verse 12 is talking about, he's talking about Lucifer, which was the more, um, light bearer. Lucifer was in heaven, and, and actually the Bible actually says, um, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut to, down to the ground, you who weakens the nation? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into, the, into heaven, I will set my throne above the stars of God, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation to the north side, I will be like the Most High. That was Lucifer's goal. To be like God in power, not character, but in power. And so what happened is his pride, he fell. And so he is called the son of the morning or light bearer. But Jesus, in chapter 22 of Revelation, verse 16, says this, I am Jesus, and I am the one who sent my angel to tell you, to tell all of you these things for the churches. I am David's great descendant. And I am the bright morning star. So how could it be that Satan is the bright morning star and Jesus is the bright, is the bright morning star? Which one is it? Which one is it? And so beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Why? Because even today's Bibles are misconstrued. They are perverted. And people are now confused, which is what which is what the term Babylon comes from, confusion. And so, if you don't know your Bible, you can be easily deceived by what people are, are saying. If you don't read your Bible, and if you just listen to either the Pope or the pastor or the priest or whoever you have you, you like, you, then you are doomed to failure because you also need to go and study for yourself to know whether that person is telling the truth or not. Now, next thing. How about the... How about the... Good News Translation? Or which I actually called Bad News trans trans Translation. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, same thing in King of Babylon, which is Lucifer, bright morning star, Bright morning star, again, bright morning star, you have fallen from heaven. Question, okay, in the past you conquered nations, but now you have been thrown to the ground. In again, chapter 22 of Revelation verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angels to announce these things to you in the churches. I am descended from the family of David. I am the bright morning star. So which one is it? Now the question is, did Jesus fall from heaven? Or did he actually decide to come down from heaven to die on the cross for us and for our sins? Huh. Think about that part. If you look at the message of the altar of sacrifice, I'm sure you're going to realize that Christ actually came down to die on the cross for our sins. He was a he and fall from the sky. And so, and so, friends, be careful of what you read and who you listen to because whether it's me or anybody else, even if it's me, go back to your Bible and read for yourself. Go back to your Bible and read for yourself to see whether I am making it up or if I am telling the truth. Go back, don't listen to anybody, just look at what the Bible says by itself. So you can know for sure you are not being deceived. And lastly, 
Lastly, I think this one is more disturbing because well, it's actually not more disturbing, but it's also as disturbing as this one because it's not a good thing at all. Why? Because you know how people now uh, like to do emoji signs um, instead of saying instead of writing bye, they show that hand that that is waving, <laughs> or instead of um, saying amen. They show like some hand clapping. And now it seems as we are going to a direction that is, I don't know where it's coming from. Interestingly enough, it, it has become so bad that now they are making a Bible with emojis. And please do not buy the Bible. Do not buy this Bible. Do not buy this Bible. So, now, they are making Bible of, Bibles of emojis because people don't like to write anymore. And that's what I was talking about earlier. You see? Look at that hand right here. Look at that prayer right here. Right? And look at the, the angel, or God, or the stars, or light. This makes no sense. And so let's actually read what it says right here. It says, the Old Testament of the King, instead of the Crown, King James Version of the Bible. The first book, you see like a, a book type of Moses called Genesis. In the beginning, and you see that God type. This is God created the heavens this is the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of the god moved upon the face of the waters now you may ask myself you may ask yourself how do you know that's exactly what it says well guess what because i know my bible I can read through that whole chapter with with ease because I know what the chapter is about. I can read it because I've read it over and over. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. You see that good, that good, that good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. It's simple. If you, that's what I'm saying. When you read your Bible, you will know what people are saying, whether it's true or false. Even if they try to change it to images, you can know what they are saying if it is true or false. So please read your Bible. Read and eat the table for showbread. Eat the showbread. Eat the Bible so you may have God's wisdom imparted in you. So you don't get deceived by people in these last days. This is my final part uh, in this uh, in this table for showbread message. And so I really hope that all of us here um, learn today that it is dangerous to just listen to people. It is dangerous to just not study your Bible. Because people can say anything that they want and you will not be able to say anything otherwise because they don't know any better. But if you study your Bible, if you eat God's word, you will not be deceived. Friends, may God bless you. And I hope today we learned something new. I hope it inspires you to go back to your Bible and to study even more. Today was um, May 30th. It is Sabbath. I hope you ask God to help uh, for help in keeping in keeping the in keeping the 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 that they are holy at least as much as you can because yeah we know it's not easy because Satan is always trying to make us fall but ask God to help you to keep His day holy because it is a holy day today and so next we will see you again. Uh, we will see you again in uh, June 6th.
And in June 6, we're going to look at the seven branch candlestick, golden candlesticks. Until then, friends, God bless you. If I don't see you again, I hope to see you when God, when God comes the second time. Until then, bye for now.